sisters in Christ, this is truly another blessed day in the Lord. And I'm so glad about it. So we are here yet for another study. As a matter of fact, the 19th installment of the study of the gospel as recorded by John Mark, that disciple whom Jesus Christ loved. And we're so glad about it. Today we will be looking at Lesson 19, Seven Signs of the End of the World. And that is our main topic. How we have three subtopics. Sign number one, false prophets. Sign number two, wars. And sign number three, persecution. And these are the first three installments of a total of seven signs of the end of the world as recorded by John Mark and in tapping into the book of Revelation, the study of the end times where John Mark was exiled on the island that is called Patmos. However, before we venture into Friends our lesson, we are going to read our scripture. We're going to pray. Because everything by prayer and supplication make your request made known unto. Let us read scripture which be followed by prayer. And we will read from the gospel as recorded by John Mark chapter 13 verses 3 to 10. And here it reads, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel, and the gospel must be preached for all nations. Let us pray. Father, now, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this most blessed day. We thank you for this journey that you have guided us on during this day. We bless you and we lift up Jesus. Father, as we come to study this word, we pray that you will magnify our gifts, that you will sensitize our hearing, and we have studied to show ourselves to prove unto you. As Paul said, workman does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And thank you that you reminded us that we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. 
We bless you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Lord. So now we're going to launch into our first subtopic, which is entitled False Prophets. False Prophets. False Prophets. Amen. Today, most likely, is Tuesday afternoon. Jesus will make good and honor his appointment that he has made a man at Calvary. A man. He is not going to slack what God has called him to do. And one of the disciples looking around notice that there were buildings, Herod's temple at Jerusalem. And he was looking at the massive stones there. And he was amazed. Jews believed that Herod's temple would last eternally, even beyond the end times on earth, never to be destroyed. Mark 13, 2, Jesus tells his disciples, he says that, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So what Jesus let them know that anything made by the hands of man will not last eternally. All of those things made by God will last eternally according to God's will. As for Jesus' prophetic message, the Roman general Titus robbed and destroyed Herod's temple in 70 AD. Today an Islamic temple stands on the grounds in the acreage where Herod's temple once stood in all of its glory and grandeur. And its uh, temple for Islamic worship is known as the Dome of the Rock. So we are just blessed to be here. But as we look at false prophets, the first sign will be the existence of false prophets and false messiahs. Just as in 2020, there is a rise of prosperity and name it and claim it houses of worship. Jesus gives the following description to these prosperity and fake gospel churches. He tells the disciples, he said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. There are many mega churches mega church ministries who use the philosophical teachings and writings of one Dr. Norman Vincent Peale who's long gone to his demise and he was the author of a best-selling book on the New York Times book list entitled The Power of Positive Thinking and this was the basis of his teaching and many of our 
present day uh, prosperity preaching churches their theology is not theology but it's world stuff theology instead of God but their teachings are based upon the power of positive thinking encouraging people to do things that make them feel good as opposed to worshiping God in spirit and in truth that he would uh, empower them to go out and do ministry Jesus Christ sent his disciples out two by two he told them just only carry the necessities the basic things they need don't carry a satchel full of clothes don't carry a whole lot of money but go out and, and, and whatever folks feed you that's what you live on whatever uh, a range they had whether they were in poverty or whatever middle class you live with them and you will stay there with them during your uh, ministry amen uh, campaign and you don't leave there but he said if they don't receive you he said against them you shake the very dust off your feet this is what the gospel is all about it's all about reaching God's people amen we will look at our second subheading which is entitled wars Jesus Christ mentioned wars even during Moses time there were wars when Israel was being overwhelmed by opposing army, God told Moses to lift up his hands. As long as his hand was raised up, Israel would prevail in the war. But if his hands came down, amen, then the enemy would prevail. So the raising of the hands was a posture of submissiveness, submitting to God, letting God fight his battles. So when his arms got tired, uh, some of his followers would come and hold his arms up that Israel and Hebrews could prevail in the battle. And this is what God does for us as long as we submit to God God will fight our battles as David say yea though I walk in the battle of shadow of death and evil I, I will feel no evil for my God is with me amen so God is with us. he also say he prepares a table before me in the very presence of my enemies as Jesus informs us of wars and rumors of wars amen it is a signal that the world is coming to an end but Jesus Christ says that he said the end is not really yet Jesus is referring to the end of the era of the earth's existence. Before the world ceased in existence, as the president know it, there will be wars and worldwide conflicts. There will be terrorist attacks. The onslaught of the neo Nazis who are mimicking what Hitler did in fascist Germany. We have the alt-right groups uh, forming throughout America. Uh, got their own 
private uh, militias and they uh, want to have what is a what they call a race war and they all come under this umbrella of white supremacists but there's no such thing as one race or one person being supreme over another person because the Bible said according to Paul for there is no respect of persons with God God views us all through the same lens which is called love and 1 Corinthians 13 at the 13th verse said faith love hope these three but the greatest of these is love God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life the apostle John exile to the Isle of Patmos looking through the visionary lens given to him by Jesus says this and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that set on him was death and hell followed with him God gave the rider on this pale horse this power and authority as we read in Revelation 6 8 and it reads and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth so this is the end time and God has given this rider on this pale horse the authority to help him destroy the world order because there will be no need for the world anymore as all of the saints of God will be in heaven with the Father be forever with the Lord as a matter of fact they'll be certified with their crowns of righteousness and he will authorize this rider and this horse a man to kill with the sword and those who are not killed with the sword uh, he will be able to create famines and food shortages that people will literally starve to death and it goes on to say he will also use wild animals and as part of his arsenal to kill people so this would be really a terrible time but Jesus said, even as bad as this sound, he said that uh, uh, the worst is still yet to come when he speaks these words. Uh, he says, these things are only the beginning of troubles. That's what he says. He said, like the first pains of a woman giving birth. Amen. But Paul said that he is Jesus who saves us from God's wrath and a judgment that is to come. Isn't God good now? During the past, amen, in most recent centuries, we have witnessed are known about or read about history books world war one world war two the korean 
conflict, the Vietnam War, the Gulf Wars, the Middle Eastern conflicts, the bombing of the Twin Towers in New York, a man the bombing at the Boston Marathon, uh, mass murders in public schools. So Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And there, here in America, brown and black people and Asian people are being marginalized and brutalize right here in America. Parents having to have conversations with their sons and daughters before they leave home as to how to posture themselves in front of some rogue police officer. Not all police officers, many or most uh, uh, servants to the people but we have that select few who have infiltrated the ranks of law enforcement, amen, to give them access to abusing people who they hate. And we could set them down at a table and say, why do you hate certain folks? I don't believe they could give you a concrete reason, but they have just been conditioned, amen, for hate. And so there are wars right here on the streets and highways in America. Presently in America, one political organization has passed legislation allowing persons to apply for and obtain license, what they call open and carry guns permits. These people can then go and purchase an assault weapon that is used on the world's battlefields with rounds of ammo strapped across their shoulders in supermarkets with assault weapons that are used in, on combat fields to assault people on the streets and the homes of America. That's why Jesus Christ said the worst has not happened yet. Jesus said this about wars in reference to the present day world conflict. He said this, he said, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nuclear war uh, almost becoming obsolete as the world has moved to what they call cyber wars or internet warfare where while you are sleeping people have stolen your personal identity. When you go to the gas station People have put gadgets in the card slot to steal your information. You have some people working in grocery stores or supermarkets and, and they are there with gadgets to steal your information and all of a sudden you go to cash a check and your bank account is empty and overdrafted because people are using cyber and the internet warfare to steal your personal identity. Amen. Banks are being shut down and stalled because people in faraway countries are using the internet warfare to shut down banks and they contact the bank from a phone, what they call burner phones, which cannot be traced to where they are, and they 
had a bank to pay them a ransom for the bank to get back online. And when the bank paid them the ransom, sometimes the millions of dollars, they allowed them to get back online. This is why Jesus Christ say the worst is still to come. Because even we're in this cyber warfare. Now this brings us to our third subheading, which is entitled Persecution. Persecution. And before we move on, we're going to look at a definition for persecution. Now, what is persecution and how is the term persecution, which is a noun, defined? Also, it has a connotation of a verb because it takes action to persecute someone after we get the definition. Persecution is defined as the infliction of pain, infliction of punishment, exacting of death upon others unjustly. See, there's very little reason that we should kill another person. Amen. Because in the Ten Commandments, God says explicitly, Thou shall not kill. You should not kill. He didn't say, However. He said, Thou or you shall not kill. So God does not give us the authority to take anyone's life. We didn't give no life, we didn't make nobody. We didn't kneel down in the dust of the earth and form a man. We did not breathe life into man's nostrils. We did not make man become a living soul. Therefore, we don't have a right to take life when God gave us life. We should not tamper with anything that God has made or created. Now, another definition is that uh, persecution causes continued pain of body or mind. See, America is guilty of the cruelty of enslaving a people, the cruelty of going to a foreign land, upsetting people's tranquility on their native soil and conspiring with unscrupulous people that look like us selling their own brothers for profit into slavery. And when we came over here to America, we were not even permitted to speak our own language. If you remember the movie Roots, uh, when LeVar Burton was playing the part of Kenty Kunte, and they wanted to give him another name, but he kept saying, my name is Kente Kunte. He was resisting being uh, having his mind destroyed and wiped clean of his heritage. And see, the mind persecution, black American and their slaves were conditioned to believe that they were, that we are inferior to the white race. They tried to condition our minds that we were made just to serve white folks, to work for them, using our 
bodies to make them as rich as they wanted to be without us having any benefits. And then there is sickness. See, this is a very soul to a persecution. Because when poor neighborhoods don't have access to health services, there is much sickness in that environment, in that neighborhood. If we could fast forward to America right now in this COVID-19 pandemic, I would, amen, hypothesize that the reason why 59 plus percent of the people dying and being afflicted by this COVID-19 is because black and brown people don't have access, amen, to the medical services. Many of them cannot, us cannot afford traditional insurance. Many can't even right now go and take a man to test for the coronavirus because they don't have the 85 to 100 dollars to pay for the test. First of all, they cannot afford the insurance. See, so sickness is a way of persecution. Then losses, and then there's calamity. Then there's adversity. Many problems, you know, that brings on come under the heading of persecution. This nation and the world watch helplessly as Brother George Floyd was dying while a policeman had his knee on his neck, cutting off the air su supply and oxygen that will flow to his brain to keep him alive while other police officers stood there, a man complicit in their arrogance and watching this poor, helpless man die while his hands were constrained with nylon ties. And he there on the ground saying, I can't breathe and, and calling out his dead mama's name. See, that is the ultimate of persecution. Amen. King David speaks these words of assurance in regard to those being persecuted in Psalm 34, 19, when he says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Did you get that? I hope you didn't miss that. Many are the afflictions of the right. That means because you are living a righteous life, because you are living worshiping God in spirit and truth, does not mean you are immune, a man, to persecution. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus said this. Reminding us that because we are right with God does not make us immune to being persecuted. Because Jesus Christ gives us the solace and confidence in John 15, 18, when he says, If the world hates you, know this, that it has hated me before it hated you. But Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes tell us when we are persecuted, he said rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He said for they persecuted the prophet who came before you. And Paul said he counted all joy to go into trouble because he's in good company because Jesus suffered 
And Paul said, because, you know, because I, I, I'm doing what Jesus did. He went through pain and he overcame it. And Paul said, he counted what? All joy. So we cannot let the devil win. Just count it all joy. Persecutions come in many different shades, hues, and genres, such as physical persecution, where someone might strike you or do you some bodily harm. See, that is a physical persecution. Then there is the verbal persecution. Someone might call you by a cuss word name. So that is a verbal persecution. Someone might call you a racial slur. That is verbal persecution. That's in an effort to make you feel bad about yourself. And then there is the psychological persecution. Uh, this is what you call psychological warfare. In other words, getting inside of your head. You see, Satan with Jesus, when Jesus had come from the wilderness out there with wild animals being tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights when Jesus had survived the wilderness tests which God put him through the devil wanted to have one last rodeo ride. He wanted to get inside of Jesus' head. He figured to get inside Jesus' head to doing one little thing he said do, he could really control Jesus. Therefore, see, Jesus came to seek and save those in the world who are lost. Therefore, if he get to save the world, then Satan, through uh, a man, a tool of psychological warfare on Jesus' mind, he would then be the ruler of the world. He would give himself a promotion from being the prince of the air to being the ruler of the world. When he said, if you be the son of God, he's trying to get inside of Jesus' head. I play a mind game on it. He said, turn the stones into bread. But Jesus Christ did not fall for the psychological warfare of Satan. When Jesus said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed from the mouth of God. Therefore, what we're saying here, if you want to, your best weapon against psychological warfare, and mental warfare, and verbal warfare, is to have a solid relationship with God Almighty. Now, there was one prominent person in America uh, who made reference to black and brown people as toilet hole nations. So, uh, this person wanted to use a, a blanket assault or persecution on uh, entire nations and continent of uh, people by calling them toilet hole nations. See, that was meant, but if we look around the world in America, if we look at the world, everything that's in the world came from brown people. The cradle of civilization, a man, started in the Nile Valley. The Egyptians, a man, were dark, brown, and black people, not as in Cleopatra when they showed Elizabeth Taylor, you know, being white, long, flowing hair, and with blue eyes, and hair slightly blonde. 
this is not who the Egyptians were then, and they are not now. See, that is another form of psychological warfare in Hollywood when they portray a man the light of races as being the superior race to make others feel inferior to them. So that's a psychological warfare. Amen. And there was one brother, a man who had a script for a movie, and he went to some rich movie producers and he presented his script they read the script and he needed 15 20 million dollars so we got the money available this, 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 well, there's one thing go back and rewrite your script but in that script we want you to have a white hero in there and we will give you the money to make this movie so psychologically they want us to believe that we are inferior to everybody else so even there uh, when Colin Kaepernick kneeled humbly protesting racial injustice in America he was not disparaging the flag he was not disparaging America but he was attempt to call out attention to the psychological warfare that had gone on for centuries, the psychological persecution uh, in the Star Spangled Banner, in that third stanza. I don't have the wisdom for me right now. If you have the opportunity to read it, 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 it says about if a slave so happened to, and see, that's what Francis Scott T. said, you go out and get them. If you have to, kill them. If you just read that third standard, so so uh, America wants everybody to stand up when the Star Spangled Banner is played and place their right hand over their heart and get all teary eyed. But while at the certain, while at the same time, in that song, it is reeks of persecution. And Francis Scott Key, who even wrote the song, was a persecutor. Of black folks in America. This is why Colin Kaepernick kneeled, but because he did not succumb to the attempt to further persecute him, he lost his NFL contract. Nobody else picked him up. Everybody disparaged him. Not everybody, but many did. The Apostle Paul who was jailed, beaten with 40 lashes, minus one, chained between two guards, 24 hours a day. Shipwreck gives us this antidote for overcoming persecutions. When he say, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus even tells us to turn the other she and he said if someone make you go one mile he said don't just go one mile but go two he was talking about how the roman soldiers were persecuting jews he said see they would force them to walk long distances until they would physically drop out and many would die he said if they make you walk one mile show them that you're not going to be controlled by them just go on and walk two miles. That's what he tells us. But Paul was shipwrecked. But he said, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When the gospel has been preached to all nations, then and only then will the Lord make his coronation and return for the marriage feast of the Lamb. Now, this is not saying Jesus Christ is not coming back until this, the gospel is preached, but he is saying that he'll be back because the gospel will be preached throughout the world, and this is to give everybody in the world, whether they are Greek, Jew, Gentile, Muslim, Sheik, 
Islamic, Quaker, whatever they might be, they will have an opportunity to get saved. So Jesus Christ is going to be sure that the gospel has been preached. Everybody won't say that, well, I, I Lord, my name not in the book because I didn't know this. But Jesus Christ, before the world ends, he will make sure that everybody will hear the gospel according to Jesus Christ. Because in scriptures say that at the name of Jesus, every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. This means that when the gospel is preached, every religious, whether it's cult or witchcraft, whatever it might be, will have the opportunity to hear the gospel. They will be exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if they don't make it in, it's because they have refused to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and the gospel must first be preached to all, the, all nationalities of people and persons. Amen. 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 Now, what is the end result of the gospel being preached to all nations? What is the benefit of the gospel? Why listen to the gospel? Why study the gospel? And the Apostle John, who was the only one who was not executed, but he was exiled to the island of Patmos. No one but him and wild animals, and he had to live off of the land. And John, looking through the vision that Jesus Christ had given him, uh, spoke these words in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. He said, And I heard the number of of the sealed. In other words, those who had been sealed, a man by the Lamb of God, who had the lambs, a man mark and imprint on their forehead, identifying them as connected to Almighty God, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That was their badge, their nameplate, that identified them. He said, I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So in Israel, there were 12 tribes, but each tribe consisted of hundreds of thousands of people. But these 144,000 were the one who came close to perfection of following God. But no man is perfect but God. No man is good but God. But they came closest to following everything that God had called on man to do. So God, the Son, identified 144,000 thousand. But now some say, well, you mean out of all of these billions of people over all of these years, only 144,000 going to heaven? No, that's not what it was saying. See, this, these one was sealed, amen, by the seal of the Lamb of God on their foreheads. They were given special recognition, amen, for the totality of their commitment a man to Almighty God, His Son, and the Holy Ghost. But see, now these are not these are not all that were going to get into heaven. 
Now we're going to get some clarity now. So no one will go out saying, well, I buy what's just going on because on, on 144,000, uh, I want to be in that 144,000. But no, it, it's going to be that. Now look, look, look what, uh, listen to what uh, a, a, a man, Jesus speaks through uh, the Apostle Paul on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Reading from the English Standard Version, he says, After this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb and clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Let's go back and unwrap this a little bit further that we could get the ingredients of what's wrapped up in this scripture here. He said, he said, I looked and behold, he said, he said, a great multitude that no man could number. Multitude mean he said multitude. He didn't give a, 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 a concrete number. He said multitude that no man could number. So many that nobody could keep count. Even the greatest supercomputer could not number the people. So that means Jesus won the victory. Jesus came to earth to seek and save those who were lost. So I mean, he saved countless people. So many that no man could count how many he saved because if it had been on a few, then he would have lost the battle. See, God fights all of our battles. See, so the devil is not winning the battle. See, the devil wants to make you the think that he is winning. See, he want to use that psychological warfare on you, psychological persecution, to make you believe that what he is winning when he's actually losing a man every step of the way. See, he lost when Jesus Christ came out of the wilderness, and, and when Jesus Christ, a man, beat back a man of three temptations that he confronted Jesus with. The Bible said Satan left him for a season, which means that he was going to come back again. And so we hear about him again, a man at Armageddon, a man in the Bible, when Satan, a man assembled all the evil people with him, and he gets on this mountain called what? Armageddon, and he's going to fight against God. But God allowed him at that time, he will, he will allow him at that time to assemble all the people with him. And you read scripture, God is going to send fire and consume all of them and one hot sweep. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? But here, uh, uh, John said, a number no man can number. He's all tribes and peoples of languages stand before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robe. Nobody can say that I'm dressed better than you. Nobody can be a better dressed God. Everybody's going to be is the same in God's eyesight. And they're going to have palm branches in their hands. Uh, a palm branch is a symbol of peace and love. As Jesus Christ, when he descended uh, Bethphage, coming down from the Mount of Olives, uh, going down the boulevard of the streets of Jerusalem, a man riding a lowly dunking people through palm leaves and their coats along the ground saying, Hosanna. Lord, save us now. That's what they were saying. Lord, save us now. And see, the fact they said that in that in that number, no man can number. Many of those people there in that number that no man can number. Amen. They are, they will be there. Amen. With the Lord. But Jesus says, you and every saved Christian will be hated because you are the sheep who are following Him. See, oh, we follow Jesus. The world began to persecute us because see, Satan has people with other agendas. So Satan always has opposed God. Amen. He's always opposed you. He's always opposed the Holy Spirit. But see, but there is a blessing for you remaining, for you remaining faithful to the Lord. See, the Lord bless you if we remain faithful to him. As we read Mark 13, 13 reads, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. That that that's powerful stuff. That, that that's powerful. 
Though sometimes they fail in their spiritual journey, true believers always get up and continue as they follow Jesus. Jesus Christ's word is follow many. As many as received him caused he to be the sons of God. And Psalm 37, 24, it was read from the Good News Bible, says if they fail, they will not stay. If they fall, rather, they will not stay down because the Lord will help them. If you can't get up by yourself, if we're following Jesus, he's going to be right there to pick us up. Jairus had lost his daughter to death, but Jesus came in that room, put all the professional mourners out, and took this dead girl's corpse, and took this dead girl's corpse by the hand, and then raised her up in the bed, and her body was filled with life. And he struck the parents to give her something to eat. Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb. Lazarus, deep inside of the deep recesses of the tomb. But Jesus Christ, with compassion in his heart, on the way to Lazarus' tomb, the Bible said Jesus, Jesus groaned with inside himself. He had anguish with inside of himself. I mean, he had empathy with inside of himself. He had sympathy for Mary and Martha. All of this was weighing on Jesus because Jesus, amen, was a frequent visitor and a boarder at the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he was deeply hurt because Lazarus had died. But when he went to the tomb, Perhaps as far as the eye could see, there were grave tombs all over the landscape of that cemetery. But Jesus only called one name that day. He said, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And when Jesus had spoken those words, there was a moving and a shaking inside of that tomb. And only one person dead person moved in that graveyard, and that was Lazarus. And Jesus said, loose him, loose him, and let him go. Jesus Christ was telling the people to help Lazarus, but he was also speaking to death. Tell death what? Let him go there, because I had put light in his dead body. He's alive again. But just as Jesus Christ endured the cross, and got up on Sunday morning. Save Christians who endure will be rewarded with deliverance by the Lord. Listen to what Jesus' brother Jude says. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So when God forgives us, when God heals us, then we are justified, amen, by the grace of God. You could take that word just, when he heals us or forgives us, watch us sin, it is just as if you never did it. Because in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, you can be new in Christ today. You might be persecuted. You might be beat up on. You might be spat up on. But when you let go and let God, God will fight your battles. And Jesus Christ is fighting about right now. But you got to go to him and tell him all about your troubles. And he'll take it from there. Just tell him all about your troubles. Let us pray. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your holy Bible. We thank you for the myriad and countless number of hours 
that your children and your saints have spent in Bible study and continue to study your word. Because we know your word is more powerful than any two-edged sword. It cuts going and it cuts coming back. Amen. And we know that we thank you that you are the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you that you are not an author of confusion. Amen. But you are author of righteousness. We thank you right now. Just bless us like only you can, Father. Bless right now until we meet again. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Lord.